All right. Good evening, everyone. It's Tuesday night, which is public night here at the Leitner Observatory and Planetarium. Make sure my mic is on. Looks good. How's everyone tonight? Uh, I'm Michael Faison. I teach in the astronomy department at Yale, and I'm the director of the Leitner Observatory and Planetarium here in New Haven. And I've been doing these uh, live streams on Tuesday nights uh, since mid-April. Unfortunately, the planetarium and observatory is closed to the public. Normally, every Tuesday night, we open up to the public and we do planetarium shows and sometimes special guest lectures. And if the sky, uh, sky is clear, we'll set up the telescopes outside for public viewing. Uh, so for now, I'm doing these live streams talking about what's up in the sky and some astronomy news and taking questions from the uh, YouTube live chat about astronomy or anything that's going on. And sometimes showing a planetarium show and sometimes showing live images through the telescopes. So uh, we're not open to the public, as I said. Yale, Yale campus is still closed to the public. Um, I, uh, we are partially open to uh, research. So Yale was uh, closed to non-COVID research, non-essential research for, for quite a while. Um, and now, as of this month, um, other faculty and other researchers can come in and undergo some safety training and, and follow some safety protocols in order to get access to labs and uh, use the equipment on campus. So I've been able to come in some days and um, uh, work on the uh, observatory. And I've actually been able to set up the 12-inch uh, telescope for my summer research program, which is coming up in a few weeks. So this is a live view that you're seeing from the um, observing deck. And you can see our Paramount ME mount, which is normally out there covered in a tarp. You may have seen it in other live streams or other visits. We use it in the summer for research and then in the fall for advanced astronomy labs. Um, and uh, uh, I needed to upgrade the electronics for our summer program because the students are going to be doing remote observing with our 12-inch telescope and our 16-inch telescope. Um, and uh, I managed this week to upgrade the electronics and get everything working uh, and do some test observations a couple of nights ago. And if it clears up, it's uh, kind of partly cloudy at this moment, at this instant. Um, but if it clears up, I'd like to try to take some images of uh, supernovae and other galaxies and maybe some other interesting objects as well. But I'm not sure it's going to be clear. I can show you some of the images that I took uh, earlier this week. Uh, oh, a couple of people are commenting on my haircut. Thank you very much. We're still, uh, my, in my family, we're still uh, <laughs> isolating and quarantining. And so we don't go see um, our wonderful hair cutter. Both my wife and I see Dan Lyons at the Hive in New Haven. And uh, 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 my wife cut my hair two months ago and I thought did a pretty good job. But I think last night she was kind of grumpy. <laughs> she uh, got very aggressive uh, with, the, with the trimmers. Uh, so yes, I saw, I noticed a couple of people <laughs> noticed my haircut. She told me I should wear a hat. I said, no, it looks great. That's just exactly what I wanted. <laughs> there are a couple of really bald spots, but you know, what can you do? This is, this is the sign of the times, right? One of the one of the many troubling signs of the times is people with uh, homemade homemade haircuts. Um, so if it does clear up, I will uh, point the telescope at some interesting objects, and um, uh, we'll we'll, we'll get to that when it gets a little bit darker. Um, I'm going to be able to do the live stream uh, next week, so I'll have something new to present next week if you're if you're following these. Uh, probably then I'm going to have to take a break in order to finish setting up for our summer research program and then to run our summer research program, which starts on June 29th. So I'll have a group of high school students logging in remotely to do classes with me um, and some of other other uh, staff. And uh, then they're going to connect remotely, like I'm going to do to our 12-inch and 16-inch telescope and take images of supernovae and star clusters and um, uh, galaxies and, and other interesting targets. Okay, um, so let me talk a little bit about um, astronomy news. I'm going to switch over to my browser here. Okay. Okay. So uh, in a few previous uh, live streams, I've talked about my hunt for Comet Swan. Um, I've gone out to look for it twice, and even though I know I was looking in the right place, I couldn't see it. Um, and it turns out that the comet uh, has dimmed significantly. 
So it may well have either broken up um, or lost its mojo uh, when it was close to perihelion. So it has, it is singing its swan song. It's gotten much dimmer. Um, and so it's probably not going to be visible. So it's kind of gone the way of uh, Comet Atlas. And this is not uncommon uh, that these uh, comets that come from the very distant outer solar system made of ice and dust uh, swing by the sun, get close to the sun, and they just, they just fall apart because they're relatively uh, fragile. Um, uh, oh, I just saw a uh, comment pop up. Uh, you had mentioned books a few weeks ago for learning astronomy. Can you tell me the titles? Yes. Um, I think a good book for learning the constellations is a book called 365 Starry Nights. Um, and it's written by Chet Ramo. Uh, that's the book that I used as a uh, a, a kid and a, a teenager to learn the constellations. And I posted a, a link, the title and the author and a, and a link to that book in the um, description for last week's live stream. If you go back and look at that, you can find that. Um, there are a lot of other good ones. Um, uh, there's the the uh, Curious George, the Ray book for learning the constellations, which gives you um, alternate figures, alternate, alternate shapes for the uh, Constellations, that's a classic. A lot of uh, people learn the constellations from that book as well. Um, if you're interested more in astrophysics, uh, there are a lot of good books. And actually, I think the um, the book that I use for my college classes is really good, and it's free. Um, it's by OpenStax, and it's just called Astronomy. So um, actually, if you just Google OpenStax, O-P-E-N-S-T-A-X, and then astronomy. There are actually these free textbooks in lots of different uh, math and science subjects. Um, you can get a PDF on for free on your computer, or there's an app that you can download, or you can buy a printed copy if you really want a printed copy, copy of that book. And that's a really great introductory book on astrophysics for a high school student or an advanced amateur astronomer or a college student. I, I use it in some of my astronomy college classes. Um, any other interesting astronomy news that I want to mention? Uh, there's There are no good uh, space station passes tonight. I wanted to see if there were going to be any that I could watch. Um, you can see where the orbit of the space station right now. If, if you, In order to get a good um, sunset space station or satellite pass, the object needs to go basically overhead right when it's twilight where, where you are. So you see... Um, the Earth is turning to the east, and the space station is orbiting around, so you can see where it is there. And if we ask for predictions of uh, any space station visible passes, you know, we could ask for all of the passes, and it'll tell you all of the times that it's above your horizon. But these are not visible. It has to be just a little bit after twilight for in order to see the in order to see the pass. It takes about ninety minutes for the space station to orbit all the way around the Earth, so quite fast. Um, and as the Earth turns underneath the space station, it passes over different places of the Earth. Um, if we ask for what are the space station passes, this is a 10-day period, so this is going up to June 19th. Uh, here we are, 19th through the 29th, so these are morning passes. And at, in any one particular place, it kind of depends on your latitude, but in a particular place, you tend to get a clumping of evening passes and then a, clumping, a clump of morning passes. Um, so if you like to get up early in the morning, this clump is good. And then we, it's going to be a while before we switch back to evening passes. Where is the evening passes? Here are some right here. Here's one. Uh, yeah. Okay. Evening passes, evening passes. Yes. Anyway, so this is the website that I showed last time, uh, heavens-above.com for tracking space station passes. Um, we, the phase of the moon tonight is a little bit past full. I think it was full last, uh, Friday. Uh, and uh, people, for some reason, people, the press and people are interested in these, uh, traditional names for the full moon. Uh, every month, the, the full moon in every month has a name, right? Like harvest moon in September and the wolf moon. I forget what month that is. Uh, a few, uh, months ago we had the, uh, pink moon and people were asking me is the moon why was the moon pink no it was just the name of the moon <laughs> or strawberry moon right um so uh there the full moon was last uh friday and there was a partial 
lunar eclipse that happened. Now, it wasn't visible at all from North America, um, but there are a few photos of it online that you can see of this partial eclipse. This is, was a penumbral eclipse where the moon doesn't pass through the dark part of the Earth's shadow, where the Earth is completely blocking sunlight from some parts of the moon or the whole moon if it's a total lunar eclipse. But rather, the moon passes through kind of the edge of the Earth's shadow. And um, what you would actually have if you were on the moon is a partial solar eclipse. So looking at the sun and the moon, the moon doesn't go exactly between the earth, uh, between the sun and the moon, but it kind of grazes it. And so the sun dims a little bit. And so the moon ends up dimming a little bit. So I don't get that excited about penumbral eclipses because you don't even really see anything. Uh, <laughs> you know, you don't see that that dark blood red um, coppery light on the full moon during uh, a, a, a total lunar eclipse and you don't see the um, the edge of the shadow of the moon which is one of the ways you can show that the earth is round <laughs> if anyone need, you know needs convincing during the partial phase of a lunar eclipse you can see that the shadow of the earth on the moon is round uh, so penumbral eclipses aren't that exciting but what i think is interesting about this penumbral eclipse there's a penumbral eclipse and then an annular eclipse that I talked about on June 21st. And then uh, there is another penumbral eclipse two weeks after that. So we have two lunar eclipses a month apart, which is not that common. Um, let me actually show you the pattern of lunar and solar eclipses. This is um, ancient astronomical knowledge, being able to predict eclipses right? Uh, ancient Greeks knew about this, but anything you can see with the naked eye um, has gone back many, many thousands, hundreds of thousands of years. Astronomers, human astronomers have known about this. It's interesting to see how different civilizations and different time periods in very different parts of the world have used their astronomy knowledge to predict when eclipses might happen. Uh, one of my favorite examples of this is in the pre-Columbian Mayan civilization, there was a table, a very sophisticated table for counting out the intervals, average intervals between eclipses. And so they were able to predict eclipses that way. But uh, this is a table which uh, shows the pattern really nicely. Um, the vertical axis here is month and the horizontal axis here is year. And so if we sort of highlight over these different little balls, every gray ball is a lunar eclipse even a partial lunar eclipse. And every yellow ball is a solar eclipse, even a partial or an annular solar eclipse. So we're in 2020. Uh, there is the lunar eclipse from last Friday, a penumbral eclipse. Here is the annular eclipse on June 21st, um, which is only visible in, you see, Africa, Asia. Um, it's going sort of right through the Middle East and through uh, kind of the Himalayas uh, area in Asia. And then two weeks after that, another penumbral eclipse on July 5th, uh, 2020. So we know that the moon's going to be full on that particular date. And um, it's interesting to see how this, the seasons of eclipses drift through the year. Um, and it's true that you have basically two eclipse seasons per year. This is because in order to have a lunar or a solar eclipse, the moon, the sun, and the earth all have to be in a straight line. And the moon's orbit around the earth is actually tilted by about five degrees, so that uh, normally the moon might be, it doesn't quite line up with the sun when we have a new moon or when we have a full moon. So the moon might be a little bit above the sun or a little bit below the sun or a little bit above the earth's shadow or a little bit below the shadow. But there are two times of year when they're in line and you can potentially have an eclipse. And those are the eclipse seasons. So this year in 2020, eclipse season is in June. Uh, and then there's another eclipse season about six months later. And it's about six cycles of the moon, not literally six calendar months. Um, I, I think this is a fascinating subject. <laughs> the average time between full moons is 29 and a half days. But of course, a calendar month is 30 or 31, for fe except for February, of course. Um, and so the time when the eclipse can potentially happen will gradually shift back through the year. Um, and you can have up to five eclipses per year when things are sort of in, al in alignment um, five eclipses in two separate uh, eclipse seasons. And we have that this year. We have five 
uh, lunar and solar eclipses this year. So uh, penumbral lunar eclipse on June 5th, uh, annular solar eclipse on June 21st, uh, lunar eclipse on July 5th, which you could potentially see from Connecticut, New Haven, North America. Um, and then uh, I think uh, it happens around 11 p.m. or so. We could look at it in the simulator in a minute here. Um, and then if we go to the other eclipse season, six lunar months in the future in December, we have a penumbral eclipse uh, uh, on November 30th and then a total solar eclipse on December 14th, 2020. So this is a total eclipse that'll be visible from South America, from uh, Chile and Argentina. My, a, a couple of years ago, my family and I, we were talking about going to see this uh, eclipse. Uh, and uh, uh, I'm glad we didn't buy a plane ticket because it's probably, <laughs> probably not possible to travel um, to South America even in December this year, who knows. Um, and then if you go around to 2021, Let's see, we have a lunar eclipse. This is a total lunar eclipse uh, in May. So the eclipse season has shifted back. Not a full month. It's like about a third of a month that the eclipse season uh, shifts back. Uh, and then an annular solar eclipse visible from North America. So June 10th, 2021. Put that on your calendars. Um, and then we only have two, or we only have four eclipses in 2021, which is more common. You get a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse in a pair and then a lunar eclipse and a solar eclipse in a pair. And that's what we get most most years. Um, of course, the big eclipse, uh, the big solar eclipse for us that's coming up is the April 8th, 2024 eclipse, which is going to go uh, right through the eastern part of the United States. So if you don't have that on your calendar yet, put that on your calendar. Uh, it's definitely going to be worth trying to go someplace where the sky is, will be clear and see totality. Um, and it's actually a longer total eclipse than the one in 2017. A lot of people saw the eclipse on August, what was it, August um, 21st, I think, uh, 2017. Um, if you were clouded, if you didn't see the eclipse or if you were clouded out, uh, put this on your calendar and make an effort to go see the 2024 eclipse. I think uh, East Texas is a good place to go try to watch it. <laughs> um, and uh, there, But there are a lot of good options. Okay, um, let's go to the simulator and see what's up in the sky tonight. Uh, actually, I'll jump back out to the live view and see what it looks like outside. Ah, look, I see the shadow of the earth coming up, right? So that means that the sun has set. So it's just sort of starting to come up um, over there in the uh, in the southeast. Um, by the way, you can, it's getting kind of dark outside, so it's a little bit hard to see what's going on uh, with the telescope. But uh, the, tel the, the mount of the telescope is that red metal object and you can see the counterweights in front of that. And then the 12 inch telescope tube is on top of that. The mount is too big for the telescope. The mount was actually designed for a much bigger telescope. But this is our old uh, uh, telescope that we had before, 16 inch telescope. So it's uh, nice to get it out and use it for this, for this purpose. I think uh, we may be able to open up the observing deck for, for public observing sooner than we'll be able to open up the planetarium theater. You know, it's it's risky to have people in enclosed spaces. I would be surprised, even though some museums in Connecticut are opening, I know. <clears throat> I, I would be surprised if we're able to open the planetarium theater soon in any, in any reasonable amount of time. I, I'm not the person who makes that decision for sure. <clears throat> uh, but I, I think it is safer to be outside. Um, and so we'll hopefully have the telescope set up for public viewing on Tuesday nights sooner that sooner than that. But again, I don't make that decision. <laughs> Come back in August after our summer program and uh, we'll we'll try to update the news uh, on that. Uh, when it gets a little bit darker, I will start pointing the telescope at some bright calibration stars and we can see um, how cloudy it is. OK, let me switch over to the simulator and talk a little bit about the stars that are up in the sky this week. OK, so here's uh, my Stellarium simulator. Uh, this is a free software you can download from Stellarium.org uh, for whatever operating system you like. And it shows you the sky from any location, uh, any time of year. And we got the sun going down there over in the west. Let's go a little bit later in the evening so that the stars come out. So this is the sky around 8.30, and we'll go to 9 o'clock and then maybe 
Now, I actually, I did something that uh, I usually do in the planetarium theater when I'm doing a public show, which is to turn on some light pollution. So uh, this is actually a more realistic view of the sky from the Leitner Observatory um, on a clear night tonight. If it were clear, this is what it would look like. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a little bit sad. I maybe have been, I might have been a little bit too aggressive. I think you can see maybe a few more stars than this uh, from our location. But uh, still, it's useful to have this feature in your planetarium program to give you a realistic view of what the sky is going to look like. So let me uh, help you find some of the bright stars and constellations. And it's always helpful to look to the north and find the Big Dipper. So here's the Big Dipper right here. Hopefully you can see that. Uh, so that is the seven bright stars in the constellation of Ursa Major, the Big Bear. And they're very bright. You can see them in all but the worst uh, light pollution. And the two stars at the end of the cup point to Polaris, the North Star. Right, So there's Polaris right there. Always due north, no matter what time of night, no matter what season of the year. Um, that's because that the uh, it's because the Earth's axis of rotation points almost directly at Polaris. So as the sky appears to turn as the Earth rotates to the east, um, it appears on all of the stars in the sky rotate counterclockwise around the bright star Polaris. Um, if we go over here to the handle of the Big Dipper. We say that you arc to Arcturus, and there's the bright red star Arcturus. Uh, bright red giant relatively close to us, uh, one of the brightest stars in the sky. And if you continue on, you will spy Spica. So there's the bright star Spica, which is the brightest star in the constellation of Virgo. You can also use the other two stars in the Cup of the Big Dipper to go to the bright star Regulus right here. So Regulus is the brightest star in Leo the Lion. And Leo is easy to recognize. It's a big constellation and it's got some bright stars in it. The front of Leo kind of looks like a backwards question mark. So you can see that pattern like that. And then the back of Leo is this kind of a uh, right triangle like so where the bright star Denebola uh, is at the very back of Leo. So um, some uh, st star lore uh, illustrations show Leo reclining in the sky. I like to think of Leo as leaping across the sky. So those are his front legs right there and those his back legs uh, right there. Leo the lion leaping across the sky. Uh, let's see if there are other bright stars that I want to point out. Where, as it gets later in the year, we see more of the summer constellations in the east and fewer of the spring constellations in the west at sunset. So if we swing back over here to the east, uh, what bright stars are over here? Well, I can see the summer triangle, which I talked about last time. So we've got the bright star Vega, the bright star Deneb. Oh, I get it right there. There we go, the bright star Deneb and the bright star um, Altair, which is the brightest star in Aquila the Eagle. Okay, uh, I've had enough of this light pollution. So let me see if I can turn it off. There we go. <laughs> so if you could go someplace where the sky was really dark, uh, this is more like what the sky would look like. Um, and same star, same bright stars are out, but of course now you can see many stars. You can see, if the sky's really dark where you are, you can see roughly 2,000 stars with the naked eye. Kind of depends on if you're looking more towards the center of the Milky Way or away from the Milky Way, but of order 2,000 to 3,000 stars uh, are how many you can see with the naked eye. Um, New Haven, we can see maybe 100 uh, stars with the naked eye on a particular night. Let me turn on the constellations here. I'll turn on the lines and then the labels. So earlier I talked about some of the spring constellations like uh, Gemini, Cancer, and Leo. Um, and then at one point I talked about all of the different galaxies in Virgo. There's a galaxy that I've been tracking, the M61 galaxy, which is over here in this part, kind of between Virgo and Leo. Uh, if it clears up, we'll take a picture of it tonight. Um, and then over here in the east and the northeast, I see those summer constellations coming up, such as Hercules the hero, Ophiuchus the snake charmer, uh, Scorpius, of course, Scorpius the scorpion, um, which is has its tail hooked right into the center of the Milky Way down there. Let's go a little bit later in the evening so we can actually see that. Let me see that get a little bit higher. 
There we go. Now you can also see Jupiter and Saturn coming up. So Jupiter and Saturn, you see, are rising at about midnight or a little bit before midnight. So if you stay up later, you get up early, you have the sense, chance to see Jupiter and Saturn close together. And they're actually going to do an interesting dance over the summer and fall where they get close together and then further apart and then close together again. And actually, one of our volunteers, Dave, was telling me um, earlier there's a date in December when they're actually going to be close enough to see uh, through a low power telescope in the same view. So you can see two planets at once when you look through the telescope. So I'm looking forward to that. I hope it's clear uh, in that period in, in December. Uh, but now you can clearly see Scorpius, right? So there's Scorpius. The bright star in Scorpius is Antares, which means uh, rival of Mars, Ant Aries. Um, and that is considered the heart of uh, Scorpius in many, uh, in many forms of star lore. Um, it's a constellation in the zodiac, right? So it's along the plane of the solar system. It's in the path of the planets and the sun and the moon. This orange line called the ecliptic um, is a projection of the Earth's orbit up into space. So as the Earth orbits around the sun and all the other planets orbit in nearly the same plane around the sun, we see the sun and the moon and the naked eye planets uh, close to that orange line in the sky, kind of in front of, if you like, uh, these um, 12 different uh, constellations. 13 if you also count Ophiuchus because the sun is in Ophiuchus in November. Um, at this time, this is midnight now tonight, you can also see Sagittarius. Uh, possibly my favorite zodiac constellation. Um, it's a nifty little constellation. Sagittarius is the archer. Um, and so you can see there's a kind of classical illustration of the archer. Uh, but amateur astronomers just call it the teapot, right? So that's an asterism, a pattern of stars. And you can clearly see the spout of the teapot and the lid of the teapot and the handle of the teapot. Um, a lot of these constellations we inherited from ancient Greek astronomers, uh, or ancient uh, Arabic-speaking astronomers, North African astronomers. Um, and I say sometimes if, if the ancient Greeks had had teapots, they would have called this constellation the teapot, not, not Sagittarius. Um, Sagittarius is uh, basically the lowest part of the ecliptic. So when the sun and the moon um, and the naked eye planets are in Sagittarius, from our point of view in the Northern Hemisphere, they take very low paths across the sky. So that's where the sun is in December. In fact, I think on the December solstice, uh, uh, December 21st, the sun is right about there. Um, when the sun's there, it takes a very low path across the sky and we have winter and we have short days and long nights and it's cold. Um, and when the planets are in Sagittarius or when the moon is in Sagittarius, they also take very low paths across the sky. So that means it's not great for watching Jupiter and Saturn um, this season because uh, they're going to take relatively low arcs across the sky. Now, of course, in the southern hemisphere, they're tilted 23 and a half degrees. Um, and so these objects are going to be high in the sky for them. And then when they're on the other side of the sky <laughs> in the constellation of uh, Cancer and Leo and so forth, um, then it's high in the sky for us, but low in the sky uh, for them. So, I mean, I can show you that if I let time run forward here, if I speed up time, you can see there they go across the sky. I'll zoom out a little bit. And uh, that green line shows me when they're due south. And you can see they're not getting really that high above the horizon. There's the gibbous moon. Since we had a full moon last uh, Friday, uh, the moon is now between full and last quarter. And so you can see it rising an hour or two after midnight, um, and it's in its gibbous phase uh, be be between those two. Another, another good time to look at it with a telescope if you're staying up late. You can really see those shadows on the other side of the moon that you that's um, illuminated when we have a first quarter moon uh, or a, a waxing gibbous moon. Here we have a waning gibbous moon. So it's a nice opportunity to see shadows on that other side, the right side of the moon, if you prefer, as seen um, from the Northern Hemisphere. But yeah, uh, here in the Northern Hemisphere in June and July, uh, planets take low arcs across the sky. But it's still neat that you can see Jupiter, Saturn, 
the gibbous moon, and there's the planet Mars over there um, in the constellation of Aquarius. This is now the sky at about 4 a.m. So if you get up early, uh, go out, look to the south, you can see Jupiter, Saturn, the moon, and then Mars. And actually Venus is now coming around and on the other side of the sun, and you can potentially see Venus in the early morning sky now that it's coming around to the other side of the sun. So there's Venus rising just before the sun uh, this week. Okay, let me go back to sunset tonight and uh, see if there's anything else I want to point out. Here is the sky at about, let's go back to about 930 or so. And I want to look at some potential uh, binocular and telescope objects. So let me turn on all of the star clusters and galaxies and nebulae and so forth. The spring galaxies are still out, so you can still uh, catch the um, Virgo cluster galaxies and the Leo galaxies with your binoculars or your small telescope. Um, and the galaxy that I have been looking at is M61. Uh, I'll search for it here and show you where it is. There we go. So there it is. That's what it looks like. That was my thumbnail for the live stream this week. Um, and uh, there's a supernova in this galaxy, which we've been monitoring for about a month um, in order to test our equipment and also have some test data for the students that are going to be working on supernova, uh, supernova modeling in, um, in July. Um, but uh, And it's a moderately bright galaxy. You could see it with a, a small telescope if the sky is dark. But some of the, the easier targets include things like um, M87. The brighter galaxies in the Virgo cluster are up here. So M87 is a good target to look for. Um, I mean, how would you find it with binoculars? Um, it's good to find the nebula, which is a bright star. That's the one at the tail of Leo. There's Leo again. Um, and then there's the star Spica, which, remember, is the star that you arc to arc Taurus, continue to spy Spica. If you sort of look between Denebola and Spica, you can see some of the dimmer stars in, um, in Virgo. And this one right here, Venda Matrix, great name. <laughs> um, between that star and Denebola is where the brightest stars in the Virgo, uh, brightest galaxies uh, in the Virgo cluster are. These galaxies are all about 50 to 60 million light years away. And the brighter ones you can see with 10 by 50 binoculars if your sky is dark. And if you have, say, a 4-inch to a 6-inch, 8-inch telescope, um, uh, you can see many of these other ones. So uh, great, great targets to see in the mid to late spring and early summer. Now, the objects that are coming up that are uh, summer targets for binoculars include globular star clusters. So early summer is a great time to look at globular star clusters, which we did in the live stream a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and w one of the best to see in the northern hemisphere is the great star cluster in Hercules. So that is the huge, bright uh, star cluster called M13 right there, uh, or the great Hercules star cluster. And it's pretty easy to find with binoculars. Uh, Jeffrey's asking, how do you remember all of this? Well, I'm an astronomer. I am. <laughs> uh, you know, it's actually an interesting thing. Um, a lot of professional astronomers don't know very much star lore or don't know how to um, uh, find things with a telescope. Um, I'm a little bit unusual in that I was an amateur astronomer growing up. I lived in uh, rural parts of a rural part of Alabama where the skies were really dark, um, and I had a small telescope. And uh, I went. Out, I was really interested in science, <laughs> and so I went out and I learned the constellations and looked at Saturn through the telescope, looked at uh, Halley's comet through the telescope, and did all of the amateur astronomy stuff. Um, and then uh, went to college to study physics and started doing astrophysics research and got very interested in radio astronomy and. Um, studying the Milky Way galaxy and how the Milky Way works, basically the gas in the Milky Way and how it forms stars. And so um, I went to graduate school in astrophysics and did my PhD at the VLA in New Mexico, um, studying the gas in the Milky Way, um, and did research for several years, and then had the chance to do more teaching and more outreach, running small observatories and so forth. So it's nice that my experience and my interest in amateur astronomy 
can work work together with my training in professional astrophysics research to do planetarium shows. And I produce planetarium shows, and I do a lot of labs for both high school students and college students, um, and so forth. So I, I I really enjoy doing that. That's how that's how I remember all of this is I've been uh, studying it for thirty years and uh, <laughs> uh, and also doing presentations for. 20 something years, 25 years, something like that. Um, let's see, other interesting targets. So as we get later in the summer, the uh, the summer triangle is full of great stuff. Um, so some of the targets will point our telescopes at um, when we have clear nights on public night include the Ring Nebula, which is over here in the constellation of Lyra. Right. So if we zoom in on the Ring Nebula, you can see there it is right there. This is a planetary nebula. So uh, different, not a star cluster. This is actually uh, a colleague of mine calls these uh, stellar corpse <laughs> nebulae. Uh, this is the outer layer of a star that has died. The core of the star ran out of fuel and collapsed. And the outer layers of the star expand to form these glowing shells of gas. They don't last for very long. They last a few tens of thousands of years or so. And they're expanding. They're getting bigger. You don't see them expanding in the telescope because it's going to take tens of or hundreds of thousands of years for them to expand and cool. But uh, this is what the end of a low mass star's uh, life looks like. Um, and they make this is a bright object. You can see it with binoculars, although it helps to have a little bit more magnification with this object because it's quite small. So you can find it with binoculars. Um, but uh, having a telescope with like 60 to 100 times magnification makes it a little bit easier uh, to see. Um, see, any other targets I want to point out? Lots of beautiful Milky Way uh, star clusters and nebulae and planetary nebulae and so forth in the plane of the Milky Way, kind of over here in this part of the sky between uh, Cygnus and Aquila and Ophiuchus. Um, in fact, this part of the Milky Way down here, kind of between um, Antares and Ophiuchus and Sagittarius is full of just beautiful uh, dust nebulae and reflection nebulae and emission nebulae um, and, and so forth. Okay. All right. Well, it's about uh, 8.30 or actually 8.37. Um, let's see. Uh, question. Michael, I would also like to know the books you mentioned, please, when you get a chance. Yeah, I mentioned a little bit earlier. Um, yeah, I, I do recommend this book, 365 Starry Nights, for learning the constellations and learning star lore. Um, there are several. That's one that I know because I look, that's how I learned the constellations as a kid. Um, and I put a link to it uh, in the description for the live stream last week. Uh, if you're interested, you don't have to buy a book. You can, of course, learn the constellations and star lore using something like Stellarium or using um, there's there are resources on uh, the Web. Uh, you know, you can Google uh, Google articles on the different constellations to learn some of the star lore and learn some of the astrophysics about objects um, in those. But I do recommend that book, 365 Starry Nights. Every page of the book shows um, a night of the year and describes a constellation and maybe an object that you can see in the sky on that night uh, because the constellations are seasonal. As the Earth orbits the sun, we see different the line of sight from the Earth to the universe changes, um, and we see different stars. So it's a great way to organize the sky. Fantastic book. Um, let's see. How is the sky doing? It's getting darker. Um, I was thinking about, uh, did I want to show a planetarium show tonight um, if it was cloudy or uh, not dark yet? Um, I was thinking actually what I would show is another piece of software that I recommend uh, if you're interested in uh, learning about the universe, which is free. And this is a program that comes from the American Museum of Natural History. So let me switch over to this. It's a program called Open Space. So, um, okay, I'm switching over to this program. And... Um, let me also switch over here. Okay, 
So it's gotten dark. <laughs> um, I had zoomed in on the uh, Liner Observatory, so uh, but it's it's it actually simulates the Earth and uh, nighttime and daytime on the Earth. So I'm going to have to zoom out. And I'll explain what this is here in a minute when I get something interesting to look at. Um, it's kind of like uh, a, a universe simulator, but now in a 3D mode, right? So I was hovering over Connecticut there a minute ago, and I just flew away from Connecticut, and now I'm hovering over the Earth. And I can actually look over here at California on the West Coast where it's still daylight, right? Uh, this program connects to the internet and gets the current uh, weather patterns and cloud patterns. So you can actually see the uh, counterclockwise spiral of Cristobal, the, the tropical storm that's over the kind of Midwest uh, right now. And you can see that it's dark over here on the East Coast. And I think maybe you can see Lake Michigan right about there. And I'll go back over here kind of towards California. So this is an incredibly ambitious uh, universe and data visualization package. And you can download it for free uh, from the American Museum of Natural History. So that's the Hayden Planetarium uh, in New York. And let me show you actually the, um, the website if I have it here. Let's see. Um, oh, I have it in this other. Here we go. Uh, here we go. So uh, this is where you would download it. So openspaceproject.com. Uh, so uh, this is a 3D simula uh, simulation of the universe based on real data. This is something that I find extremely impressive. So uh, you can download the basic version. Now they call this beta, so it, you know it's not a ready, completely uh, <laughs> perfected um, <laughs> program. I haven't noticed any really terrible bugs. I have noticed it's not extremely well optimized. For example, when I run this, my computer's CPU and graphics card go crazy with the fans blowing. It's using a lot of system resources to render the universe. Um, but uh, you can download this for Mac or for Windows. Um, you can make donations to the project. You can update uh, the software whenever you need to. Uh, there was an article about this software in the New York Times uh, like two, about two years ago. So uh, Carter Emmert, who's the, he's a visualization guru <laughs> at uh, the Hayden Planetarium, really interesting character, um, but he's kind of the, the brain behind open space. And, and this article, I think, is very interesting. It explains what their goals are in terms of making open space and releasing it to the public. Planetariums use it. Um, I've been wanting to install it on our planetarium system. Uh, Hopefully we'll have the chance to do that uh, soon. Um, but I use it on my desktop computer a lot to try out different things and try out different visualizations. And it has a very sophisticated model of planetary atmospheres and planetary orbits and satellites and galaxy positions and so forth. So what I thought I would do is do um, a quick tour of the universe using open space. And so let's do that. Let me, uh, let me go back to open space. And let's just head out into the universe and see what we see. So uh, the camera controls are fairly simple so far. I can zoom in and out and I can pan my camera around and I can rotate my camera around. Let's rotate so that north is at the top of the screen here. And you can see some of the, uh, well, where I'm located. So I'm hovering around that position right there at that altitude. So let's keep flying out. And as we go out, you'll see some satellites. I think that's the space station orbit right there. And there's the moon right there. So if I were to actually pan over here, you can see where the moon is relative to the Earth. There's the moon right there behind us. And since the date and the time are correct, um, that is the actual position of the moon relative to the Earth and the sun. If I want to see where the sun is, I just swing over here. And there you see, well, the, sun, the Earth is being lit by the sun, and the moon is being lit by the sun, and all of the planets are being lit by the sun. Um, and you can kind of get a feel for that. 
uh, by panning around here. You can also see real positions of bright stars. So for example, the sun is in the constellation of Taurus right now. And so there's the constellation of Taurus right there. Uh, there's the star Aldebaran. There's the Pleiades star cluster right there. You can see it now in the morning sky um, <laughs> if you get up early. And right down there, I see the constellation of Orion. So um, you can see the, the colors of the stars are a little bit exaggerated, but you can see there's the bright red supergiant Betelgeuse um, and the belt of Orion right there, the bright star Rigel. One of the closest stars to us, Sirius, which is the brightest star in the sky, and it's only about nine light years away. Uh, and then you can see some of the nebulae in the Milky Way. So there you can see kind of the plane of the Milky Way along there. There's the Andromeda Galaxy. Do you see that little fuzz, that little blurry uh, oval right there? That's the Andromeda Galaxy. And we can fly out to the Andromeda Galaxy in the simulation seamlessly from the surface of the Earth um, out to the moon, out to the planets, out to nearby stars, uh, and out of the Milky Way. So let's let's go a couple of steps out. Let's go, um, let's zoom out. Now, there are ways to control the motion of the camera, um, and you can actually write a script that will, there you see the orbit of the moon right there. But there's a way you can write a script to actually control the camera and have it fly different different ways, and you can basically make a movie. You can make a cinematic movie using this, um, using this simulator. So there is the orbit of the moon. Let's keep zooming back. Here we go. Now we're looking at sort of the planets in the inner solar system. So there you can see the orbit of Mercury, the orbit of Venus, the orbit of the Earth in blue. Earth is always in blue, of course. Um, and then there is the planet Mars uh, right there. And then we have a big gap between Mars and Jupiter. Let's keep going out. So there's Jupiter and then there's Saturn astronomical units and then uh, Saturn is, uh, is at about 10 um, and then Uranus is at about 20. <laughs> you double the distance from the Sun going from uh, uh, Jupiter to Saturn and then again to Uranus. There's Neptune out there the blue line and then of course since this is a uh, American Museum of Natural History since this is a Hayden Planetarium uh, <laughs> uh, software package no Pluto. <laughs> uh, you can see there's there's the plane of the solar system right there. Um, that green dot might be Pluto. I'm not quite sure. I think that's either Pluto or a comet. Um, so we've left the solar system and actually let's keep, let's keep scrolling back. The next thing that we would see to ch see change is the positions of the stars. And I kind of want to keep both Aldebaran and Sirius here in the field of view because they are two relatively close stars. So they're the ones we're going to see start to shift more now we're on the starship enterprise heading away from the sun at some point the software replaces the model of the sun with this kind of yellow glow so it looks more like the nearby stars and now i'm starting to see sirius shift around and procyon shift around and if i were to scan around the sun i'm still centered on the earth here you can see that the positions of the stars seem to shift so i'm 1.5 light years from the sun at this point We'll keep flying out. All right, now we're seeing quite a few stars shift. And something that's interesting about the stars near the sun, most of the stars near the sun are too dim to see with the naked eye. So these are red dwarf stars that have very low intrinsic brightness. Uh, red dwarf stars are maybe one one hundredth as bright as the sun. Um, and there's uh, several dozens of them closer than uh, uh, Sirius to us. Not the closest star. The closest, well, actually, the closest star is a red dwarf, Proxima Centauri, and it's in the Alpha Centauri system, um, and it's a red dwarf, and it's 4.2 light years away. Uh, Sirius is then at nine light years, and there's about a dozen or so red dwarfs that are between uh, four light years and nine light years um, that are too dim to be seen with the naked eye. Again, if I kind of pan around, you can see the positions of the stars change. Um, there's the Big Dipper right there. So let's actually move a little bit further back and we can kind of move to the, see the Big Dipper from the side. <laughs> um, if I kind of look at it from the sun's perspective, it looks like the Big Dipper, 
But then if I kind of move around, you can see that, oh yeah, the stars in the Big Dipper are not all at the same distance. Although it's interesting, of the seven stars in the Big Dipper, the five that are in the middle are closer together and uh, they're moving through the galaxy in kind of the same direction. And so we think those five stars are related to each other. Maybe they formed at the same time in the same star cluster and they're kind of moving, co-moving uh, through the Milky Way. Whereas the stars on the ends, the end of the handle and the end of the cup are not at all related to the other stars um, in the Big Dipper. So let's keep moving, moving away. I still have the sun at the center of my perspective here, but now the sun is uh, it's not even visible, is it? Uh, yeah, I don't even see it anymore. So we're um, 16 parsecs. A parsec is a unit that astronomers use to specify distance, right? Famously, uh, Harrison Ford did the Kessel run, and I forget, was it 8 parsecs, uh, 12, 11, 14? <laughs> it changed in the different movies. Someone in the chat tell me how fast the Millennium Falcon did the Kessel run. Um, but parsec is a unit of distance that's about three and a third light years. So 16 parsecs is then what, something like uh, 50 light years or so? Keep moving back, keep moving back, keep moving back, right? And now we're seeing some of the nearby star clusters all kind of in the same place, right? So there's a star cluster right there. I think that's actually the Pleiades star cluster. There's a star cluster over there, right? Uh, 50 parsecs, so about 150 light years, tiny fraction of the distance. Oh, it was 12 parsecs. <laughs> Right, but Ray got it wrong in one of the new, in one of the sequels. Right, <laughs> that was why I can't remember what it was anymore. Uh, let's keep moving back, moving back, moving back. Bright stars, bright stars. Now, when we start to get thousands of parsecs away from the sun, we're starting to leave the Milky Way galaxy, and I can kind of pan around and see the plane of the Milky Way. And at some point, the software replaces my dusting, my smattering of stars with a model of the Milky Way, so right about there. And this model is beautiful. I, I think this is amazing what they did, uh, you know, what Carter and his team ha have done with this software. So uh, there's the sun way down there. I'm still centered on the sun. If I kind of pan around this way, you can see the center of the Milky Way. You can see the spiral arms. You can see some of the star forming regions which have kind of a pinkish glow to them. Let's rotate so that we have the plane kind of horizontal here. Beautiful model. Yeah, I, I can't wait. I, I'm going to put some time in to get this uh, up on our on our dome in the uh, planetarium here. The problem is, is one of the problems is our uh, graphics card in our planetarium projector is getting a little bit old. So we actually need to upgrade it. It's not as fast as the one that I have on my desktop. So we need to upgrade it in order to do simulations uh, like this. Uh, okay, let's keep zooming out. Now we're, we've left the Milky Way and we're going to start to see other galaxies, right? So now what they've done is color-coded the positions of other galaxies near the Milky Way. And you can start to see some of that large-scale structure of galaxies over millions or hundreds of millions of light years. All right, let's keep moving out. And actually, you should be able to see the Virgo cluster and that line of galaxies that I talked about before that goes from Virgo up to, um, actually from uh, below Virgo, up through Virgo, up through Leo, up through Coma, and up to uh, the Big Dipper. You can see that line of galaxies in this map. Now, I still have the sun and the earth right here in the center. That's probably the Virgo cluster right there, that big one right there. Right, so if we orient like so, there you can see that line of galaxies from our point of view going almost vertical to a horizon in the spring uh, as seen from our latitude. I'm gonna keep zooming out. And is there anything more to the universe? Uh, you know, you get to these really, really big scales. We're now 100 megaparsecs away from the sun. So that's roughly 300 million light years. And the observable universe has a look back time. It's a kind of distance based on light travel time of uh, 14 billion light years, right? So you can sort of compare that to the fraction of the universe that we've mapped out here in this simulation. Let's keep going, keep going, keep going. And by the way, these galaxies are color coded as to which cluster and supercluster they belong to. So you can actually look in, look into the, the labeling in the, in the software and figure out which galaxy clusters are which. Zooming out, zooming out, zooming out. 
Okay, it sort of makes them all brighter. This looks just like a um, Hayden Planetarium. If any of you have seen the Hayden Planetarium show uh, about dark matter uh, and the and dark energy that they've been showing, uh, <laughs> you can see it's based on these same kind of graphics. But now this is based on that um, uh, deep uh, two degree field survey showing galaxy clusters out to several billion light years. Real data taken from telescopes. Keep zooming out, keep zooming out. It sort of thins out, not because there aren't any galaxies out there, but because the galaxies that are out there are fainter. And we need bigger telescopes in order to get good measurements of their distance from uh, the Earth. And let's keep zooming out, zooming out, zooming out. So five gigaparsecs. Now we're getting to basically the edge of the observable universe. And the way that they model this in, uh, <laughs> in open space is to show the cosmic microwave background radiation anisotropies. So this is a famous image. Uh, I think this one is from the Planck satellite, the Planck Space Telescope, showing basically the uh, hot, the, the, uh, the radiation from when the universe was a dense plasma about uh, 100,000 years after the Big Bang. <laughs> and that's the most distant thing we can see in our universe. That's the edge of the observable universe. Amazing. I, I am just, uh, I think this is a beautiful representation of these data and our observable universe. And I think it's amazing that you can, using a desktop computer, uh, you know, go through all of these scales relatively quickly. Let's fly back home now. All right, so. And back to the Milky Way. There's the Milky Way. There are the stars near the sun. And there comes the sun, that little yellow dot. There's our solar system. <laughs> There's the Earth. There's the moon orbiting the Earth. And then here we are back on the surface of the Earth. And I can tell we're kind of looking on the northern hemisphere towards the south because I recognize some of these southern stars. You can see there is, uh, that's actually Alpha Centauri right there. That one is Alpha Centauri. And then actually if we look over here, oh wait, just back over this way, you can see the Southern Cross. There's the Southern Cross right there. <laughs> uh, so we're looking, we're seeing the, the northern hemisphere and it's in the direction that the southern hemisphere sees the sky on the other side. Uh, get a little bit closer, maybe. Where are we dropping down? I think we're dropping down on China now. Right. We're going to drop you down in the Gobi Desert. <laughs> well, that's where it happens to be daytime now. Uh, if you're patient, it'll actually load high-resolution satellite images of whatever part of the Earth that you're over, but it takes a little while to download those tiles, kind of like using Google Earth. All right. Any, uh, any questions? Yeah, it's uh, free software from the American uh, Museum of Natural History. Um, it is beta software, so it could have bugs, um, but uh, you know you can always download updates. I know they've been working on it for years, and uh, it is really amazing. You can, instead of just focusing on the Earth, you can focus on other objects. Um, you know, we can focus on Mars. Uh, let's see. Let's zoom into Mars. It's flying us there. Um, these are just the objects in the, the predefined menu, but you can also, um, we have to fly in now with the camera, uh, but you can also set up other objects. You know, you can, you can find objects to, that you particularly want to, to zoom in on or get amazing movies of. There are there are other there's other software that's a little bit more user friendly that costs money. Um, uh, one that I've used to demo for my students is called Universe Sandbox, and that's very nice because it has a physics simulator in it. So you can do things like um, build a, a solar system and try and get the planets to orbit the sun, <laughs> and uh, they off, they always crash into each other. <laughs> um, and uh, but uh, but it's fun to play with, and it has also amazing graphics like this. This I think is a, is impressive because it's real data from NASA and from European Space Agency and and from astronomers, um, and it's all made to work very smoothly on many many different uh, scales, right? So you can zoom right in on the Earth, you can zoom right in on the planets. Um, I think it's a fantastic teaching school. 
Uh, do I only work with high school and college students? I mostly work with college students, and then in the summers I work with high school students. Um, and then year round, when we open the observatory, I work with the public, people who come up for public night. Um, usually we have grad students uh, or undergrad students who are presenting the planetarium shows. Um, but I often, when it's clear, will set up the telescopes outside for a public viewing. Um, so those are the main, the main types of uh, groups that I work with. OK, well, it's 9 o'clock. Um, let's see if it's clear. So I'm going to switch back to um, the, the, the deck cam here. Uh, and, and just one more time, I'll put a link to this software in the description for this video. But if you just Google um, open space or openspaceproject.org, that will take you to, uh, to the, where you can download the software and read the documentation and so forth. The other program that I mentioned that costs money is called Universe Sandbox. And again, if you just Google Universe Sandbox, it's not, it's not very expensive. It's maybe 40 or $50, I think, to buy it and download it. Uh, middle school students? Uh, no, not very often. I don't work with middle school students very often. We do have a school program here at the Observatory and Planetarium when school is open, obviously. Um, so we do have um, middle school and elementary school and high school students that come in for planetarium shows and activities, but I don't do any of those uh, programs. We've talked about having a summer program for local high school students, which is something I'd like to get off the ground in a couple of years. We have this program for high school students, and we'd like to launch another program for middle, middle school students. Um, OK, the sky outside. OK, it's dark, but it looks pretty cloudy. Uh, <laughs> my live camera has switched over to uh, infrared, and you can see the phenomenal number of bugs flying <laughs> around out there uh, on the deck. They're attracted to the, to the light on the camera. Um, and it looks pretty cloudy. I can show you uh, the telescope moving around. I can connect to the telescope fairly easy from where I am. Uh, anyone anywhere in the world could connect to this telescope if you know the password. <laughs> if you join one of our classes or one of our programs, then we'll set you up to, to run this telescope. Um, but for example, I can set up the tel I can get the telescope ready to observe. Uh, I'll, sh I'll demonstrate this. So the first thing that we do when we're getting ready to observe with either the 12 inch or the 16 inch telescope is obviously we turn it on and get the computers running and so forth. And then we do this procedure called homing where the telescope will point to a particular orientation um, and then it knows where it's pointing in the sky. And that's the first step of being able to point at things accurately. This is our this is a research grade telescope mount. Um, uh, it's designed for doing advanced projects and even for automated or remote telescope operation for for special projects. Um, we may eventually move this telescope mount to a remote observatory someplace where the sky is really dark, so that we can do remote uh, and automated observing someplace where, where skies are dark. Uh, we get better data. Um, yeah, so now the telescope is oriented, and so I could point at um, some particular object. I think it's pretty cloudy, though. I'm going to run out and look at the sky myself really quickly and report. I'll be right back. Yeah, I think it's too cloudy for, for public observing or for uh, galaxy observing or supernova observing tonight. I went out and looked to the west where there's still some twilight and there's a lot of fluffy uh, cumulus clouds tonight. Um, so clouds tonight, but I think maybe it'll clear up a little bit later this week. So uh, if it clears up, I think it may cl be clear on Friday or Saturday. Um, go outside, find some of these uh, bright stars and constellations that I pointed out before. Look for the Big Dipper that's almost directly overhead, a little bit west of overhead. Use the Big Dipper to find Arcturus and Spica uh, and Leo. Uh, and then look for the um, Summer Triangle rising in the east. And then if you like to stay up late, watch for Jupiter and Saturn rising a little bit after midnight. 
and being high in the sky at 4 a.m., relatively high in the sky at 4 a.m. And later in the summer, they're going to be even higher uh, at, uh, at sunset, and we'll have the chance to look at them through the telescopes. So uh, if there aren't any other questions, I think I'll sign off there for tonight. And again, I thank you for uh, participating, those of you who watch the stream live and uh, ask questions. Uh, I'm definitely doing uh, a live stream next Tuesday night, Tuesday night for public night. Um, and then I'm probably going to take a break for the summer program for a few weeks. So I'll be away until the middle of August um, and then come back and talk about some new stuff. All right. Well, uh, if you're interested in finding out about the Leitner Observatory, our website is Leitner Observatory, uh, L-E-I-T-N-E-R observatory edu, And you can send us email at info at leitnerobservatory.org. You're also welcome to send me an email. Uh, I'm michael.fason, F-A-I-S-O-N, at el.edu. And thanks to everyone for participating. Uh, clear skies. Stay safe out there. And uh, see you next time.